Hello and welcome along to another episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. This week, Charlie catches up with former Northern Irish footballer Jerry Flynn to talk about the start of his career at Hull City over in England before moving back to Northern Ireland and the switch from professional to semi-professional football to play for the likes of Cliftonville, Ballymena and Coleraine. We also talk about managerial duties and a spell with Nuri before moving over to Spain where he is now to become a successful businessman. Jerry's got a really interesting story to tell and we can't thank him enough for his time. If you do enjoy the episode, please do put a thumbs up on it and subscribe down below for regular content from the Honest Football Podcast. But this is Jerry Flynn's football story and we hope you enjoy it. And I'm delighted to say that Jerry's with us now. Jerry, I can't thank you enough for obviously giving up uh, your time. I know it's probably beautiful weather where you are, but it's actually beautiful weather over in England as well today, which makes a change. So I appreciate you giving up your time to speak to us. You're more than welcome, Charlie. Uh, yeah, I've just had a couple of messages from friends back home in Belfast and they've been sending me, I think it's 23, 24 there today. So still not on par with us. We're 31 today. I'm just <laughs> in off. A, uh, I've done about 40 kilometres on the bike today. So I'm well tired at the minute, but I'm delighted to be on your podcast. No, thank you so much. Um, so we'll go through sort of your career and obviously, you know, a, a very successful time as a player and then what you're doing now. But what we always like to do with anyone who, who's played professionally at the elite level of the game is, is actually go back to where it began. So can you remember your first ever memory of football, whether it be in the garden or playing for a team or anything like that, really? Where did it all begin for you? Uh, yeah, um, well, I've always, we, we used to live in a high rise flat where, where I originally came from in the New Lodge in Belfast and we had a landing. So I had a couple of friends and we always were banging a ball from as, as early as I can remember, two, three, maybe four year old. So we were always playing there. And then as we got a little bit older, we were allowed out. So we would have played down on a, a little bit of gravel outside the flats as well. And then I think at about the age of nine, I moved to Glen Gormley and I signed, or well not signed, but I, I started playing for a team called Glen Colts. So that was probably my earliest memory, apart from playing in the school team in P7 that I can remember playing organised football as such uh, with a really good side like Glenn Colts. Stephen Morrow, who ended up going on to play for Arsenal and stuff, what a came from Glenn Colts, his dad was one of the managers. So um, we had good pedigree in the, in the side. And as I say, that's probably the earliest fo- organised football uh, that I can remember. Yeah. Do you remember watching like what your first game maybe on TV or going to a ground was? The first game I went to was the Derby, Manchester United and Man City. Um, as you see behind me, I'm a massive Manchester yeah. United fan. So I can remember that my uncle came into the boxing club where I was training. It was 1977, so I would have been five. And we, he took me off to Manchester to watch the Man City, Man United Derby at Old Trafford. So that was my first, first memory of going to a game. Mm-hmm. And then I used to follow Cliftonville, where I came from. was That would have been my team that I supported as a boy. But I didn't start going there until I was about 13, 14. Yeah. But Manchester United became my first organised match that I ever went to. Right. Um, and you obviously mentioned about playing for, for your school team earlier on. Obviously, with any sort of professionals, I suppose, have different stories. You know, people who go on to play professionally. I mean, were you that much better than everyone else in your year group at school? Or was it a bit of a later sort of thing for you in that sense? Um, no, I wouldn't have been. I would probably, you know, there would have been, if I can remember, to our P7 side. There was a guy called Alan Brown who ended up going to Arsenal and West Ham and stuff. But he surprisingly, he, he never made it. Uh, Alan was probably the best player I've ever seen and played with. At a young age, he just he literally had everything. But no, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't even have been in the top five in our school team. Even I was sort of would have been a late developer when my friends would have been starting to get carryouts at 15, 16, 17. I would have been drinking milk, uh, <laughs> running down to the city hall and back again. We all laugh about it now, but you know, I was just that determined yeah. to become a professional footballer. But I would have been a late developer. You know, I'd never get on any of the schoolboy teams or representative teams for Northern Ireland. But uh, no, it wasn't until I was uh, 17 when I signed professional for Hull City mm. um, that I was sort of like a late developer. Yeah, you, you, you've led nicely on to the next part, which is obviously that, that sort of journey to hold. Just, um, just a couple of questions sort of to begin with on that. Like, so how did that happen? And also, if you don't mind me asking a slightly more personal question, was there an element of homesickness about it? Because I've spoken to a few lads from Northern Ireland, because my, my in-laws are from there as well. And they've, some have said they felt quite homesick. Others have just jumped straight into it and loved, sort of loved it from the minute the word goes. So how was that for you? Well, I was playing for Bangor, um, and I'd just been on the verge of the, the first team, but playing predominantly youth team and reserves. And um, there was a, a scout came along, and he took us over in trial, uh, played one game. I think we we uh, we beat Sunderland. I think it was or one nil in a trial game. And there was another guy along with me called Dean Nelson, who played in my youth team and reserve team for for Bangor. 
and Hull ended up, after we came back, they said they wanted to sign the both of us. But at the particular time, Dean was, I think he was about 16, but he was already married and had one or two kids at the time. So it did financially, it couldn't work out for him to go across because he couldn't sign professional. I signed professional and there was a little bit of element of homesick, but I wasn't that, you know, I just threw everything into training. And when I look at it back now, I just wish I had had confidence because I went away and I always thought that English lads were better than me and they should be playing and I shouldn't. So if I did struggle with anything, it was a lack of confidence, but it wasn't homesickness. And probably at the time, if I look back, I probably wasn't good enough. But again, I put it down to confidence. If I had a new then, what I know now, then I probably would have spent a little bit more time in England. But uh, mm. no, I, I wasn't homesick at all. No. What, what from, a, from a football perspective, what was the sort of biggest difference that hit you first of all? Was it like, you know, the speed or the physicality coming from obviously what you were playing before you went to Hull City? I think it was just the coaching, you know, you, and, and not being uh, derogatory towards the coaches that who, who took me at Bangor, but... When I first went to, to Hull City, there was a guy called Dale Roberts. God rest him, he, he's, he's no longer with us, but he played for Ipswich. So he was our youth team coach at, at Hull. And then Mick Doherty would have been our reserve team coach as well. So there was always different pointers and they were always like teaching you different things where at Bangor, it wasn't so much that, where they get into the, the tactics more. And, you know, as a fullback, if, say, a midfielder comes towards you, you're thinking in behind the fullback. If he runs away, then he's going to check and give it in defeat. Simple things that you just learnt right away. And there was more patterns of play and shape. And But as I say, I, I love my time at Hull. And, you know, I had some great memories there. And I achieved a goal of being a professional footballer, albeit it was only for a couple of years. Mm. So then obviously, you know, before we moved back over to, to you know, come, coming back over the water for a better phrase, was there offers elsewhere? Like, so how did that time at Hull come to an end? And, and could you have stayed in England and gone elsewhere in that sense? Or um, well, I think at the time, the scout who had sent me says, you know, he could get me a lot of money coming back, signing for a club called Ards back in the Irish League. And like I signed professional forms at the time. I was on £95 a week. I had to pay my own digs, tax, insurance out of it. So I was literally on buttons. My mum used to send me £10 every Monday just to see me through the week. But there was rumours I could have went to Scunthorpe or Scarborough on trial, but I just really wanted to get back. And then when I did get back, I ended up going down and speaking to Leicester City were uh, on tour and then they played a game against Monaghan and I went down and spoke to Brian Little and he said he would bring me over because Charlie, the scout, ended up, he had moved to Leicester at this stage, uh, but nothing ever materialised. And then there was a couple of wormers that uh, I could have been going, different clubs in England were interested again because when I did come back, I ended up signing for Ballyclare. Mm. I had a decent season. And there was rumours, but nothing ever materialised after that. So, uh, you know, I was happy to stay in the Irish League. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate your honesty on that. I mean, I've been, my, my wife's from um, Northern Ireland. She moved over about 10 years ago. So we don't, whenever we go back, I always go and watch Ballymena because that would be the nearest team to, um, to us. We'll get, get on to that bit in a bit. But I've got to say the Irish League, my, my favourite sort of football to watch. And I'm, I'm lucky to watch quite a lot of it. But yeah, it's definitely the most... Uh, it's definitely the most entertaining as well. So I can understand, even from a football perspective, maybe the, the draw to come back. But um, if you're not going to ask me just a, a slightly personal question on your mentality coming back, being in a full-time environment and then obviously the Irish League, and, you know, being a part-time environment, was there an element of, not do you think you'd be able to walk back into it, but, you know, do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Was there, not an arrogant way, but do you know what I mean? Sort of, did you feel like maybe this would be a bit beneath you or? Um, no, not at all, because as I say, I, I keep going back and I've said it to other people, I always lack confidence and it wasn't until I played, maybe I played 400 games in the Irish League and I was about 30 at the time when my best friend, he had moved into the house with me that I owned and uh, we used to just have chats at night and he was saying like, are you crazy? You played 400 games? Like, well, why are you confident? But I don't know whether it was a case of, I had no education when I was younger, I gave everything, you know, I'd never done any exams, I just wanted to play football. You know, I'm an avid reader at the minute. I'm reading about three books now and I'm, I'm in the education. I love learning. I don't know whether that was it or but it was a confidence thing. And even when I did come back, as I say, I, I, I could have signed for a couple of clubs, but I went I went to Ards for a month. Roy Coyle, um, who was very successful at Linfield, he was the manager at the time. But it was quite funny because Charlie had told me he would get me £250 a week when I come back. And I'm thinking, 95 at Hull, yeah. 250 at Ards. I was on the, I was on the first plane back. So his first offer to me was £15 a week. And we were yeah. sitting in his out in the office and I'm looking at Charlie going, and he says, oh, but that's his first offer. I says, he's not going to jump from 15 to 250. 
No, but I ended up signing for Ballyclare. And uh, as I say, I, I was a left back originally at Hull. I played left side for Ballyclare with um, my good friend Jim Platt, ex-Middlesbrough goalkeeper in Northern Ireland. And we, came, we became really good friends and still are to this day. I had a good season. I think I won Young Player of the Year at Ballyclare. And then I moved to Cliftonville. So, no, I never really, I never thought it was, it was beneath me or anything. And I still trained as hard even though I wasn't in a full-time environment, but I still would have trained maybe five times a week on my own. And I'd done that the whole way through my career. You know, I, I always worked hard. I wasn't gifted by any means. I always had to work hard at my game uh, just mm -hmm. to stay at that level that I, that I finally did uh, reach. Obviously, you mentioned you then went to Cliftonville and, you know, probably the, the main, main part of your career was there. So you obviously oh. growing up around there, you know, around the area and being a fan, what's that like then signing for that sort of your hometown club? It was fantastic. As I say, I used to go, there was a, there was a couple of great photographs. Um, one when uh, Cliftonville very rarely beat Linfield, but they did this time at Windsor Park, which was, you know, unheard of. But it was the goalkeeper, Andy McLean, who played for Cliftonville, kicked it out of his hands. It bounced over George Dunlop's head, went into the net. So the keeper scored the winner. We beat Linfield 3-2. And there's a cracking photograph of myself, Colin Gervin, my best mate, and Tim McCann, who ended up playing for Cliftonville as well. And the three of us are in the crowd. We're only about 15. And you just see us with our hands up and stuff. But, you know, it was a great photograph. And then when you when you fast forward five, six years, myself and Timmy are, are, are uh, winning the league. Well, about 10 years later, myself and Timmy are winning the league with Cliftonville. So, you know, it was, it was my boyhood team that I supported as a kid, apart from Manchester United. And, uh, you know, it, it was great to play for them. I say we won the championship. They hadn't won it in, I think, 80-odd years, 88 years. And uh, we won the league against all the odds at Cliftonville. So, playing the Champions League with them, Intertoto Cup and stuff. So, uh, some great memories of Cliftonville. Yeah, you, you, you've sort of um, moved on beautifully to the next part, which obviously you said about winning the league and then playing in Europe, which, you know, not only, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of uh, envious you got to play professional football, but then to obviously go and play abroad as well must have been fascinating. What is there a difference in the football between sort of domestically and then, you know, obviously playing in the Champions League and, and scoring, in fact, that, you know, is there a difference in the style of football? Or? Absolute massive. Uh, like we, again, we played in the Intertoto Cup a few, a few years before playing in the Champions League, but... Like when I think about it, when I, my playing weight when I was at Clevenville, I think it was about 10 stone 10 and I was, I was built like a matchstick and we were going out against, I think it was Alborg we played one time, Standard Liège, uh, Stuttgart and these guys were just like carved out of stone, six foot six, just absolutely, and I'm looking like a wee scrawny and all our team were all like wee skinny things and that, that's what I noticed the difference, they were actually just solid where uh, when we looked at us coming out and sometimes you'd odd socks on and stuff <laughs> It, it was uh, it was just it was incredible it was it was brilliant but as I say then we we played in the Champions League also we got Casici uh, we got hammered but you know my claim to fame and I said all the time you know Ronaldo Messi Flynn Sedan we've all scored in the Champions League so it's one record that I hold at Clevenville and I hope it's never beaten uh, but <laughs> I'm the only person in the history to ever score in the Champions League so no I can't take that away from you I think that's that's, that's not a bad claim to have is it. Obviously, you mentioned how much you achieved at Cliftonville. If I was to sort of press you on to what would be the one highlight that you'd have to sort of hold on to, if you could sort of bottle it and then, you know, open it up whenever you wanted, but that's the only one thing you could sort of take away. What, what would that be from your time at Cliftonville, having achieved uh, so much there? Yeah. As I say, we, we did win. We won the County Adam Shield, won the Coca-Cola Cup. I have a great memory playing and, uh, you know, we, we had been beat. I think the record, and you can look into this, it was something like 16 out of 17 penalty shootouts that we'd lost. We get to the final against Glen Torn. There's a big guy, Joe Kerr, playing alongside me. And I said, we were winning, I think it was 3-1 with about two minutes to go. And I said, Joe, look up at the Red Army. Now, there was only maybe a thousand supporters there, but they were going mental. We hadn't won a trophy in, since 1979. This was 94, 95. He says, I can't, I can't. And Joe was like a big hard strap in centre half. And I says, why? He says, I'll burst out crying. <laughs> final whistle went. It was our first trophy. We got, you know... Uh, the weight of our backs of having to do that. But I think winning the league at Cliftonville against all the odds was, was an incredible achievement. And uh, we were drunk for a week after. It was great celebrations. And as I say, I supported them as a kid. And it was, it was fantastic to win it with Cliftonville. No, I can imagine. Yeah, I think that, that would be the pinnacle you know, um, of anyone's career to win a league. But like that, it's like saying against the odds in that sense. So obviously then moving on from there, you went to, to Ballymena, which you know, a club I'd be more... Yeah, you know, I'd, is one I'd support and go and watch. 
I've actually spoken to Jared Little uh, last week, who obviously worked, uh, he played under Nigel Best as well. Why, why Balamina? Because if you don't mind me asking, and I say this to someone who follows them, you know, it, could there have been other offers for, for teams outside once you were leaving Cliftonville, you know, some of your sort of background and pedigree, or was sort of, like, why Balamina if, if anywhere else? I had a chance a few times, and then I, I sort of had a, a small run in with Marty Quinn, who was the manager at the time. I was left out of a game. I had a stubborn head on. Uh, I ended up saying, well, I want to go on the list. It was stupidity, looking back then. But I was into coaching myself and Tiernan Lynch, who's now manager of Larn. Yeah. We set up our own coaching company, EFL Soccer. And Nigel Bess was manager. And I knew that going to Balamina, I would be learning from Nigel. So that, that was probably the key factor in the decision to go to Balamina. I could have went to maybe a couple of other clubs. I did speak to a couple of others. But as I say... In hindsight, maybe should I have left, maybe not, but I did. And I enjoyed my time at, at Balamina. Um, unfortunately, Nigel only lasted about six months there, and then he got sacked. Kenny Shields had come in, and we were on the verge of getting relegated, and we, we ended up, we did get relegated. Mm. And I think it was around about 30, 29, 30 at the time. I didn't want to play in the first division then. Mm. So I ended up rejoining Marty Quinn at uh, Korean after that, and... Everything I won in my career was under Marty Quinn. So after having that little bit of fallout with him, I ended up, we, we made up and I signed for Coleraine. Yeah, I think it's interesting because from us as fans on the outside, I suppose we don't necessarily see, like you were just talking about, you know, the, who, maybe who you're going to work for. We'd probably just look at it as objectively, you know, here's team A, here's team B, why would you make that move? So I appreciate you sort of talking about that actually because we probably don't see that side of it. And I suppose with a lot of footballers, you don't really do outside of the sort of bubble of football. Like, no, I, and as I say, you know, Nigel, I was doing a lot of work with the IFA at the time. He was involved there. I knew, like, coaching ways, um, team formations and, uh, you know, drills and stuff that I, I could learn a lot from him, which I did in a short space of time. I always remember there was a couple of little points he would have said to me about my own game. Why did I do this? You know, and I never had that before. And he was saying, look, if you had done this instead, and it stuck, you know, uh, it stuck in my head and it's little things that I did learn from him. And, you know, I really enjoyed my time at at Balamina, my mother and father, it probably, they were made the most welcome at all the clubs I ever played for. My mum, still to this day, loves Balamina, and they always looked after my dad um, when he went down. Albeit, I used to have to drive home because they used to fill him full of whiskey when he was alive. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the people at Balamina are absolutely fantastic. And uh, as I say, unfortunately, we get relegated, but at some great times. I play with Jared Littler as well, and John yeah. Gregg, yeah. and... I've made some great friends there, even to this day. Did you get any sticking moves to Coleraine? Because obviously, you know, maybe people who aren't familiar with the Irish League, you know, it's a, obviously a local derby and, and that, in, in that sense. So did you get any sort of stick for moving over or not? Yeah, a wee bit, but nothing, nothing compared to some of the other players. No, nothing to write home about. And I was, as I say, I always get on with everyone at Balamina. I always get on really well. And you always get the few chance coming out of the stands and stuff, but mm. nothing, nothing. Nothing to write home about, no. Yeah. So then we sort of move on to Nuren. You mentioned earlier about your sort of desire to, to go into coaching and all of that. So initially you went there sort of playing, didn't you? How, how do you look at the early part of your time at Nuren? How do you sort of re remember that as, as an experience? Well, as I say, I went to, I went to Korean first after Balamina. Uh, we won the Irish Cup, got to another Irish Cup. And then the chance came for me to go there to Nuri. And, you know, it was nearly the end of my career. I ended up, there was a few financial problems at Korean near the end. Chance came, I went to Newry, I got a, I think it was a two-year contract, I was around about 32, 33 at the time, and again, it was an opportunity to work with Roy Coyle, he was the most successful manager in the Irish League, it was Roy McCready first, sorry, uh, Roy get on the phone and uh, assign for Newry with Roy McCready, and then Roy Coyle came in after that, so I thought I'm going to learn a lot more, myself and Roy didn't have the best of time together really, he, you know, he, he released me and I retired, and then I ended up Again, another club that I've really fond memories with. And uh, as I say, I retired. I thought I wasn't going to play again. And then that Christmas, um, I ended up signing for Donegal Celtic for four games. Newry sacked Roy Coyle. And uh, Newry asked me back uh, advice on who they would um, get in as manager. I said, well, they're going to need um, an A licence. They're going to need this and that. And, you know, Jim O'Brien, who was the chairman at the time, uh, him and Alan Williams uh, asked me advice and all of a sudden they offered me the job and I ended up going back to Newry as player manager at the start and uh, had a really, really good time there. Loved it. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking, because you're one of the few people we've had, in fact, I think you might be the first one who's been a player manager. How, 
how difficult is that? Because from the outside, obviously, you know, I can, you, you know yourself how much do you need to devote to be a player, but then also to be a manager and, and your standards, I suppose. Like, how does that all work really? How did you find that? Really difficult because when you're a player, you know you've just got to prepare yourself mm. for a Saturday. You're eating, you're sleeping, your mentality, what you've got to think. And, you know, but all of a sudden I was looking at maybe 16, 17 players and then fitting in and then, you know, you don't see the game because you're that intense on working, but obviously looking after your own game while you're playing. And it was quite funny because Peter Murray, who was my assistant manager at the time, I think after about four games, he says, by the way, you're done. Uh, you need to give this up. And I says, no, no, okay. He says, no, you need to get on the sideline with me. Forget about it. So we signed uh, Ross Black at the time. He was a left back. But no, I found it difficult at the start because, as I say, you're trying to take the train and then, you know, if you're maybe not having a good a game as you should have, and then you're trying to have a go at other players and trying to put it right. And, you know, uh, it, it was... It was hard. So I only, I think I maybe, I don't even know. I don't think I played any more than six, maybe eight games maximum when I was player manager. And I know definitely the following season, that was me. I hung the boots up. So yeah. it was only about three or four months. Mm. No, I appreciate that. And then um, obviously sort of towards the end of, of Nuri, I suppose there was a, a slight sort of disagreement over a few bits. Do you, uh, that aside, do you look at your, do you sort of look back at your time at Nuri as a, as a sort of positive experience or no one maybe learnt a lot, even though maybe it didn't, quite end maybe the way you wanted it to if that makes sense yeah definitely and again I've made some great friends and I still keep in contact with a lot of people at Newry I went in I'd set up the whole academy and mm. you know that was my whole focus of you know I'd done my pro license based on you know setting up an academy at Newry speaking to all the parents what they're doing with their kids between the hours that they're spending coaching at Newry uh, and this is what you should be feeding them when they go home and this is the whole thing behind it so I try to go in as I say I resigned at one stage I did go back it's it's all gone uh, it's all water under the bridge now mm. again a bit of stubbornness from both sides as I say they're back now they're doing really well uh, they were in the premiership they did get relegated but it'll not be long before Newry's back up there and mm. it's one of the results I always look out for and uh, as I say some great lads down there some of the players still playing when I was manager and as I say great people and great friends so. mm. yeah no and sort of last question before we move on to now I spoke to Gary Haveron recently as well and um, he, he told me to ask you would do you miss managing would you ever like to go back into it or are you sort of fairly happy with what you, you're sort of doing now in that sense uh, I don't think so no um I just, you know, the, the amount of energy that I put into it and the fact that my own personal life and, you know, if we had been beat on a Saturday for toxic, I didn't come around until a Tuesday and it was on for my wife and everyone else who, my family circle, the stress that I put myself under. I love the changing rooms. I love the banter. I love what I'm doing now, speaking to people back home and doing podcasts. I still keep my finger in a little bit, recommend the odd player and different things and speak to managers. But no, I love what I'm doing now. I don't think I'll ever go back. When I get the lingo properly out here, all the terminology, I might do a little bit of coaching at maybe under 14, 15 mm -hmm. level or something like that. But no, nah, I think the days of management are, are well and truly gone. No, I appreciate that. No, thank you for, for, for sort of being honest about that. So you mentioned about sort of now, um, for those people who maybe aren't as familiar, what are you doing now? We'll go on to your podcast in a bit, but I know in terms of, you know, not working in football, but what sort of... What um, well, I'm living out in Spain now. I moved here, it'll be 10 years ago this September. I have a couple of bars, a car hire company, I sell property, and we have an investment company also. So mm. I'm quite busy. Uh, as you say, we, we were extremely hit with uh, COVID-19. But you know what? I always say to people, your health's your wealth and, you know, everyone around me is healthy at the minute and uh, we'll get through it, albeit it's a massive setback. But as I say, we're healthy and uh, we'll get through it. And yeah, I love I love living out here in Spain. Yeah. So you obviously may be passing the time as well through the, this sort of uh, experience you mentioned about your podcast, which, you know, I've listened to and I've got to say it's fantastic. And, you know, I've learned a lot about a lot of people who you've spoken to. Where, where did that come from? Where was the idea from that? And, you know, I, you know how did that sort of come about really? Well, what happened was I was just sitting in the garden one day and the lockdown here in Spain and especially in the region of Murthy, it was completely different to what it was in the UK and, and in Ireland. And I was sitting one day and I was just thinking of different things about Irish League and my memories because we literally weren't allowed out of the garden apart from going to the supermarket or, or chemist. And you had to prove, you know, if I, if, if I went out and just to get, say, a baguette and if I didn't know water, it was a, a fine. The police always checked you and stuff. So it really was a proper lockdown. 
So out of boredom, I done a story about Marty Quinn punching a Stuttgart fan. And I started doing my little stories. And then as each one went on, there's a guy on Twitter called Marshall Gillespie. Yes. And he, yeah, yeah Marshall puts up photographs. And I was saying, flip, I played with him. Michael Surgeon, oh, I played with him. So it's a running joke now. Like, I've played with every player that he puts a photograph <laughs> of. But he was invaluable for me for, like, stories. And then I'd be on and people were laughing about it. And he said, do you remember such and such? And I, so I was doing like two minute, 20 stories. And then myself and my best friend, Colm, uh, we started the podcast. And as I say, it's, it's been fantastic. And I'm giving away free football kits to kids, things back home and stuff. So any money raised out of our website or out through the podcast, we give it back to uh, deserving teams. So that's the whole ethos behind it. Yeah, so. That's amazing. And um, just before we move on to sort of the, the quick five bit at the end, if people wanted to sort of engage with that and, you know, watch it or even contribute, like you were saying, where, where could they find that information? Like um, that? Yeah, jerryflynn.com. All, the, all the, the football stories are on it. I have a YouTube channel, jerryflynn.com. As I say, we do the podcast with a few exciting things coming up as well. You know, uh, the more people watch it, the more money we make and the more teams get football kits. So, as I say, that's ethos behind it. And uh, you'll get me on jerryflynn.com. Uh, hats off to you. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, what we normally do is we just finish off with some quick fire questions, if that's all right. So some you've probably been asked quite a lot of, but others maybe not so. Um, first thing I want to go over is, is your favourite ground that you've ever played at, if you had to choose one. The city ground, Nuts Forest. Right. Uh, it's a proper old sort of ground, isn't it? It's, it's a great place to, uh, to watch football, obviously. I imagine even more so to play. But what wasn't a great memory because I played against, I was marking Franz Carr, the little <laughs> Dutch winger that night, and he absolutely roasted me. But <laughs> it wasn't a happy memory, but the ground was great. Yeah. The, uh, the best player you've played with or against, whichever one. Would be um, Peter Murray was my assistant. Peter was the Rolls Royce when he was at Cliftonville. And, uh, you know, I did play against him. I watched him as a boy, played against him, and then played with him at the later stage of his career and uh, then he became an assistant down in the area so mm. a good friend of mine so, yeah. um, and you, uh, I imagine I probably know the answer to this one but your favourite manager the one that you, you've enjoyed playing for the most uh, Marty Quinn yeah as I say I won every, every anything I won was under Marty Quinn so mm. uh, Connor and then the final question so this series originally started before we started speaking to professionals about their people's favourite ever games that was just fans but um, obviously because you've played at the top level we will give you sort of two favourite games so one as a player your favourite ever game that you've played in and then one favourite ever game that you've watched, which I suppose being a United fan, you've got quite a lot to choose from. But, you know, which would be your favourite ever football matches to play and watch? Ooh, that's, a, that's a difficult one. Uh, I would probably say the Irish Cup final 2003, when we beat Glen Torn. We were hanging on the last 15 minutes. Pat McAllister made a fantastic tackle. And then Tim McCann, who I was marking, got inside me. He hit one and hit the bar about 10 minutes to go. So probably 2003 Irish Cup final. And probably the best one I watched was the Champions League final when sharing them a school score. Yeah. So I have their signed jersey just up above me right. here. So that's yeah, incredible. so that's uh, that's probably my most memorable and favourite game that I that ever watched as well. Not too not, not too bad games to choose from there. To be fair, so uh, Jerry, I, I just want to say thank you so much for giving up your time. I appreciate it. obviously you know everything that's going on. So it, it means a lot to us that you give up your time to talk to us. So yeah, thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Stay cool. Thank you. Mm-hmm.